<laughs> oh, oh I, I beg your pardon, friends. I was just enjoying a passage here from uh, that great ode, uh, if you will, entitled The Hasty Pudding. Uh, this is the ode written by my friend in Connecticut, Joel Barlow. And I understand that it's been taken to heart by many who attend the, the college in Cambridge, uh, that college supported through the estate of John Harvard. Oh, but citizens, I beg your pardon here. You could hardly even tell that I was enjoying the hasty pudding uh, because of being masked. I beg your pardon that we might enjoy a confabulation again. Uh, would you allow me to remove my mask? Thank you. Ah, oh, my pleasure indeed. And I welcome you to today's conversation, uh, speaking of course about the college in Cambridge, uh, but our conversation is about our university, the project of my autumn years, our university of Virginia. I look very much forward to your questions and your interests and happy to announce once more, we have with us our friend, uh, Ms. Alice Wagner. Uh, thank you for being with us, Ms. Wagner. And uh, if you will, I should not make any further comment uh, without hearing first from uh, our, our friends. So the first question is Magnus, my delight. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Can you tell us about the genesis of your idea for the University of Virginia and why it became the, as you called it, the hobby of your old age? Ah, yes, the hobby of my old age. That's exactly what I have called my interest in creating a true University of Virginia. I have, uh, I have stated that term to Mr. Adams in our continuing correspondence. He as well is very interested in uh, establishing, if you will, universal education throughout our nation. He believes, as I do, that the only way we will be able to continue to hold the reins of self-government is through an educated citizen body. I would say that Mr. Adams and I would both agree that the inspiration for an educated citizen body began in our youth, began with the privilege that both of us had of pursuing an education. And I do this because our family had the means. It was only the privilege of the eldest sons in certain families to be able to pursue an education. I was enabled because uh, my family had the means, both from my father's side, Colonel Peter Jefferson, though he never had that opportunity, and from my mother's side, Jane Randolph. Well, Randolph's, uh, <laughs> they were a great property. And so that marriage benefited my father and particularly in allowing for his children to be well-educated. So when I was a young man, Mondays were allowed that I could attend a, a Latin school uh, or an English grammar school. It was conducted at Tuckahoe Plantation. And then uh, I attended the Reverend James Morris Classical Academy. That was out here in the wilderness uh, near where the Walkers reside at Castle Hill. And though my father was deceased shortly thereafter, only 49 when he died in 1757, monies in his estate allowed me to continue my education. And in particular, to go to the old Royal College of William and Mary. If you ask me what was inspiration, my teacher at William and Mary, Dr. William Small, I have written of him many times and spoken in kind. He had gentlemanly, correct manners, and enlarged liberal mind, and a happy talent for communication, perhaps more than any other. He fixed my destinies. There's the inspiration for an educated citizen body. Firstly and foremost, good manners. You will always notice that those who are the well-educated are those who have the finest manners and an open mind, if you will, always to all things under the sun, and a happy talent for communication because learning is a most enjoyable adventure. So this was set in me in my youth, so much so that when I was 30 years old in 1773, I was asked by John Murr, the Earl of Dunmore, the last royal governor of the whole colony of Virginia, 
to suggest an improvement of the curriculum of William and Mary beyond a collegiate curriculum, college implying, of course, a rather parochial and limited curriculum. My plan was universal, uh, opening up to further scientific investigation, new frontiers of knowledge to be discovered. So in 73, in order that William and Mary might become a university, I suggested four new schools of study. Uh, well, law, medicine, modern languages, and literature. But unfortunately, it was returned with the royal negative monies. I simply said, build it and they will come. We need to think about the future when we think about education. And so when I became the second elected governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I continued then to pursue a more universal curriculum at William and Mary. As you know, the war intercepted. And then, of course, the beginning of what was 40 years in public service. But my interest to create a true University of Virginia would not subside. It was always at the forefront. So finally, in retirement now, these autumn years, being influenced, if you will, well, by Charles Mercer's bill for an educational system in Virginia. That was back in, in 18 and 14. But even before that, I can tell you my correspondence with Governor Tyler, uh, Governor John Tyler, uh, whose son, I believe, has um, quite the political aspirations. But the father, John Tyler, with whom I attended the old Royal College of William and Mary, he and I have uh, engaged in much correspondence uh, considering to establish a university in Virginia. And finally, finally, if you will, the old literary society here in Virginia, of which I've been a member for some time, my good friends, Senator Cavill, uh, General Cock, uh, Mr. Mason, uh, Mr. Madison, Colonel Monroe, it was the literary society that decided to put forth funds from the Literary Fund to create the Albemarle Academy. Right here in Charlottesville and out of the Albemarle Academy, my interest to create more of a universal curriculum, to create the Central College. Yes, still a college, but open, if you will, through future improvements and more courses to be offered. So you see, my initial plan with old William and Mary, I held even beginning several years ago here in Charlottesville in 18 and 17. The Central College was the beginning of it. Oh, I beg your pardon, I have rambled, but this did not happen overnight. It has been lifelong. The next question, Ms. Wagner. We have a question from one of our guests. Deborah wants to know, what was the mission of the university and who was it meant to educate? The mission of a university, in my opinion, is to help to cultivate natural aristocracy. Now, that is different from artificial aristocracy. Again, this is a subject that Mr. Adams and myself uh, are continuing to correspond upon. Natural aristocracy, of course, means by merit, a meritocracy. Artificial aristocracy? What more can you say? It's, it's simply money uh, and property and birth. As I have said, you'll never find a Newton in a royal line. And so the mission has always been to cultivate natural aristocracy. Firstly and foremost, a universal system of education that can be attended to by the poor as well as the wealthy. And I will tell you, Deborah, to the female as well as the male. And this has been my lifelong struggle. And so it is hoped in creating a university to be attended to by the male, I cannot deny that, that we will be able to kick off that idea for a more universal system of education here in our Commonwealth of Virginia that will be of inspiration to allowing women in the future perhaps to attend. I'm not saying I will live to see it, uh, uh, but if we... we do not have a system of education for the male, uh, well then how can we possibly provide further uh, systems of education in the highest degree? Uh, so I hope that answers the question, that the mission should be to cultivate a meritocracy, not an aristocracy. 
to be able to found a university open to the illimitable freedom of the human mind. There's the founding principle, the illimitable freedom of the human mind. Our next question is Wagner. How did this vision of yours for the university compare to other universities in Europe or here in America? Well, I would say that uh, my particular vision is indeed unique because I see more of an academical village. Yes, purposely constructed uh, as a village, if you will, in the Socratic method of open and free inquiry. Now that would be achieved by allowing, say, pavilions, pavilions, which not only serve as the classroom, but also serve as the homes of the various professors and doms. And then the pavilions to be connected one and the other with the dormitories of the students, the students' rooms. Now, secondly, I envision our university as non-secular, that it will not have any connection to any religion or any sect. This will be most unique. It will be the first of its kind in the history of man. Many European universities and European colleges have for many, many centuries uh, evolved from their connection to, uh, to a religion uh, and to a sect. So this here in our nation is something uh, extraordinarily novel. And uh, I'm very hopeful we'll take hold again, dedicated to the illimitable freedom of the human mind, recognizing our creator has created our minds free and free he desires it to remain. Your next question. You designed all of the buildings at the university. How do you see architecture as a key part of the educational experience? Oh, well, architecture, in my opinion, is very, very important for civilized man. Uh, consider, if you will, we double our population every generation or so. So what other art could be the more important than the art we utilize to shelter ourselves while at the same time lifting our spirits, providing for improvement in our health. Uh, so this is how I see architecture being influential in the design of a university as well, an academical village, as I said earlier. Now, I mentioned the pavilions. Uh, I have suggested 10 pavilions. Uh, and I suggest that they have facades, their particular architecture, though the square footage of each of the pavilions will be somewhat the same, that on the outside, it will represent different periods uh, in the ennobling architecture of Western civilization. Uh, by that, I mean in particular the entablature, the, the columns, the capitals of the columns to be Doric, uh, Ionic, uh, Corinthian, uh, if you will, composites, all of those have been most influential uh, through the history of man. In fact, uh, Roland Chambre's uh, great work uh, on ancient architecture provides many a rare rendering uh, of drawings uh, for these facades, which I am utilizing. And I am going so far to allow uh, this architecture to be more influential by procuring the capitals of the columns to support the facades of the various pavilions, uh, to be imported of the finest Carrara marble, and uh, that it might be uh, brought across the ocean uh, into the Chesapeake, that the capitals then will sail up the James River, connect to the Rivanna, and then uh, dock at uh, my mill, at Milton. And then from Milton, uh, by wagon, the capitals brought to, well, the lawn, of our university. Now, I will tell you that many have said, well, Mr. Jefferson, this will be quite expensive, particularly in the taxation of such building materials. Well, remember, I was an attorney. These materials are for the purpose of education. It should not be taxed. So there is one of the efforts that I'm envisioning in the architecture. And I might say this further that the design of the entire university, the lawn, as I am calling it, uh, should be very much an open-ended rectangle or C. Uh, there have been many who are agreeable with me upon this subject, 
Benjamin Henry Latrobe, with whom I have corresponded, uh, even William Thornton, the architect uh, of our nation's capital in Washington City. I have seen the likes of such a design myself when I was in France as our nation's minister plenipotentiary. In fact, it was, it was Mrs. Causeway, um, Mrs. Richard Causeway, who introduced me to a most remarkable chateau just north of Versailles, uh, known as the Chateau de Marley. Uh, it sat uh, in, the, in a valley, and I was able to look down upon it from the precipice, and here was this chateau in the center, uh, which was, had to it connected uh, two uh, particular columned walkways and pavilions, opposite one and the other. And uh, in front of each of the pavilions were fountains. What was so extraordinary is the water uh, providing the animation for the fountains uh, actually uh, were from the cascade uh, coming down the mountain at the open end of the sea. And uh, if you will, that water was from a reservoir uh, into which water from the Seine River was pumped up from the opposite side of the mountain. So observing the Chateau de Marley for the first time and seeing the play, that pleasure garden of fountains in such a sublime delineation of a chateau, it suddenly came to my mind, the font of knowledge. Now, rather than the chateau at the center of the sea, what better but a library. And so there I think was an early influence uh, for the design of our university. I'm not going to deny that the Maison Corée and Nîmes uh, certainly played a part in that, uh, but I, I think that the ancient architects uh, provided for modern man what I refer to as ennobling designs in architecture. Your next question. How was enslaved labor used in building the university, landscaping the grounds, and caring for both professors and students? Well, thank you for that question, Ms. Wagner. Uh, our university could not have begun, uh, could not be sustained, could not be built in all of its ennobling architecture were it not for the enslaved. Uh, after, uh, after we purchased, when I say we, after the, the Board of Visitors of the Central College purchased the uh, 43 acres from Mr. Perry upon which to build our university, after I went over, uh, to survey how I wanted the delineations of the lawn uh, to be. I, I'll never forget it. It was June the 18th, 18 and 17. I brought my theodolite. I brought my, my locust stakes and some twine. Uh, and there I set out the landscape. Two enslaved were then immediate to clear the foliage, to clear the brush, this had been the, the former property uh, of Colonel Monroe, our President Monroe. So the very first two to work that land, preparing it for our university, uh, were two enslaved. Then, of course, the brickyard, uh, which we built uh, beyond the Western Range, just over the hill from the Western Range. But before you get to the large pond thereabouts, we built the brickyard. And all of those bricks were made, manufactured by enslaved. Uh, if you will, the attentions to all of the boys who are then to take up habitation will be uh, provided by the enslaved. Those of the professors and the dons who inhabit uh, all of the pavilions, again, attended to by the enslaved. And the sustenance of the masters, the sustenance of the students provided by the enslaved who will oversee the six hotels, uh, that is the dining uh, rooms and the, the dining emporiums. There'll be uh, three of them on each side of the lawn behind uh, the ranges. Uh, well, actually the hotels will be connected with the ranges, three on each side. Uh, they will be lettered A, B, C, a D, E, F, and of course, uh, those to cook the foods and to provide them will be the enslaved. So again, I, I cannot underestimate the influence uh, of the enslaved to bring about our university. And I, I say this decidedly with the hope that someday 
as we rid ourselves of this, this barbarous commerce uh, amongst man, that here in our nation, those who were once enslaved may have the opportunity uh, to pursue education accordingly. Our promise of our declaration will then be fulfilled, but I lament. I will not live to see it, and I provide you no excuses. Your next question. Going back for a moment for your vision uh, of public education, Barry wanted to know a little bit more about that. How do you envision that working in Virginia? Barry, did you say? Yes. Yes, well, Barry, I have had the idea of a universal system of education from the time of my youth. I, I mentioned, of course, the improvement of the curriculum at Old William and Mary when I was 30 in 17 and 73. Well, in 17 and 79, while I was governor, I introduced to the new uh, Virginia House of Delegates, they were still in Williamsburg at the time, meeting in the old Capitol building there. I introduced 126 uh, improvements to the old monarchical code of law under which we were born and grew up. These were revisions of that monarchical code. And amongst the 126, Bill 82 being the bill for religious freedom, before it was Bill 79 for more general dissemination of knowledge, for more dissemination of useful knowledge, for the building of schoolhouses all throughout Virginia, providing an elementary curriculum, as I said earlier, for the poor as well as the wealthy, for the female as well as the male, and then this to be uh, superseded by district schools all throughout our commonwealth. Now, into the district schools would be enrolled boys of, um, of promise, uh, the girls then would be able to return to their families, uh, as has been my belief, uh, where they are useful in providing the enlightenment in the families. Uh, but the boys then to enter into district schools, and then finally, thirdly, a university uh, of Virginia, into which will be admitted boys of intellectual curiosity, a great wonder, and further questioning upon all things. So, unfortunately, whereas other bills did, uh, well, were passed and, and did succeed, bill number 79 has remained a failure. For the most part, there has been little effort even to provide uh, uh, elementary curriculums throughout all of Virginia. And the reason simply is because so many uh, fear that our commonwealth is forcing them to take from their pocket their hard-earned money to pay for the education of their neighbor who can ill afford it. Well, it, it remains unto us to remind them that one's neighbor is one's fellow citizen. Yes, this, this is necessary for the enlightenment of our entire country, let alone our commonwealth of Virginia. Um, to enlighten the people generally will help cast off superstitions of body and mind like evil spirits at the dawn of day. I've written this many times that the money we will spend for education will never be more than the thousandth part of what we will spend unto future monarchs, princes, priests, and noblemen who will rise up amongst us if we leave ourselves in ignorance. So there, if you will, is my vision. It has been from my youth, and uh, I continue to pursue this like, well, not unlike Don Quixote. Your next question. What are your thoughts about the best curriculum for the university, and how do you choose the professors there? Mm. The best curriculum ought to be uh, universal, as I have emphasized throughout our discussion today. It ought to attend to every known field of study. Uh, in human history, and, as I said earlier, to new frontiers of knowledge yet to be discovered. That's a university. It continues to grow. It continues to evolve and, and prosper. So we're not only talking about uh, curriculums in pure mathematics, uh, algebra, of course, in that regard, calculus, if you will, uh, logarithms uh, in kind. Uh, we're not only talking about history, but we're also talking about government. Uh, we're talking about law. Uh, we're talking, if you will, about, um, well, uh, ideas 
to continue to, to pray. Moral uh, philosophy, as it is referred to, the association uh, of ideas. Uh, in this, we also uh, should pursue bell letters. Uh, we also should pursue elements of engineering uh, in architecture. Uh, this should not discount us either in the, in the natural philosophy, the realms of scientific investigation, geology, botany, astronomy, uh, all of these to continue to be offered by the best professors the world has to offer. Mr. Adams and I have been corresponding upon this subject. Uh, he believes that we are able to find uh, such teachers of universal subjects here on our own land, but uh, I believe uh, in time we will, but not at present. And that is why I'm interested to, to search throughout the kingdoms of Europe to search in some of the world's most ancient universities for the best minds and young minds, mind you, uh, young individuals who will welcome the opportunity to sail to our nation and take up these chairs in, in all the aforementioned subjects and others. In fact, I have asked my good friend, uh, Mr. Frank Gilmer, uh, the son of my father's good friend, uh, Dr. George Gilmer, uh, if he might not sail to Europe and select some of the finest individuals. Uh, I think the English at Oxford and Cambridge may offer us some of their finest students to take on our challenge and come here and, uh, and take on chairs at our University of Virginia. I've been told of such individuals as uh, Mr. Emmett, uh, John Patton Emmett, uh, foremost, if you will, in natural philosophy. Why well, it is said that he will even come to Virginia, he welcomes it, bringing along his white owl, his brown bear, uh, if you will, snakes, which he is very, very curious over, uh, and trays of silkworms. Well, that is what I welcome there, uh, to bring that over so that our students may see this firsthand and examine. Uh, Dr. Dunglinson, Robley Dunglinson, if you will, an Englishman of extensive uh, uh, success in studying the ailments of young children. Uh, I think he can be most useful considering how many babies have died from the complication of a simple fever. Think what Dr. Dunglinson can bring us. Uh, Charles Bonnycastle, uh, if you will, I think is, uh, is most welcome here in moral philosophy. Uh, Mr. Key, Thomas, Thomas Hewitt Key, I understand is foremost in the studies of mathematics. Now, that's not to say that we are entirely devoid uh, of our own citizen body. I, I think Mr. George Tucker uh, is most useful in order to bring about uh, the studies in law uh, and, and policing. Um, and, and I think even Gilmer himself uh, might prove available and desire to have a, have a chair uh, at our university accordingly. So you keep my mind wandering on the many professors uh, that I've been told about that I would hope to see here uh, and, and take up chairs. Now, I, I forgot to mention one, and I've been a bit hesitant. Uh, he's a gentleman from the Germanys. His name is, um, is George Bladerman. Uh, they say he is foremost uh, in the teaching of modern languages. Uh, however, they say he is somewhat irascible and uh, well, perhaps we can overlook that uh, and welcome it even, uh, even to enlighten ourselves uh, to what he has to offer that he has been taught and brought up with in the finest universities amongst the Germanys. Uh, your next question. Bridget would like to know if there are any scientists or philosophers you don't want to be taught in the UVA curriculum. Any sciences or philosophies? I, scientists or philosophers. Any scientists or philosophers that I should not want at the university? I should not care to have anyone who believes that science and philosophy ought to cloud the human mind, uh, to pull the wool of ignorance over our eyes to a mistrust of our own vision, to promote cries of raw head and bloody bones. That is not the purpose of science or philosophy. No. Science and philosophy is light, and light and liberty go together. 
any kind of a science or any kind of a cult or philosophy uh, that draws a pall over the human mind is simply darkness and ought not to be tolerated in a system of education. Education is hope. Education is freedom. Education is safety. Education is happiness. Your next question. Why is the University of Virginia one of only three accomplishments you have specified to be listed on your tombstone? You ask me why is our university one of only three that I should like to have, uh, have inscribed upon my tombstone? Well, how would you know what I desire to have inscribed upon my tombstone? That, uh, that rather startles me. Um, perhaps this question is coming from a a Federalist who would like to see my demise uh, so very shortly. Well, uh, you're not incorrect. I certainly will not deny it. I have made certain jottings as to how I would wish to be remembered. I certainly do not care to be remembered for any office that I have held, and there have been many within 40 years of public service, but they are merely offices. They are temporary. And in our nation, it is the will of the people that continues to, to elect to office uh, new blood and fresh ideas as it ought to be. A child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40, so our laws and institutions must grow as we grow as a people. But what can help steady that rudder as we sail into the future? Well, I think founding principles recognizing we're the first nation in the history of man founded upon principle, not upon monarchy, not upon, if you will, artificial aristocracy, but founded upon the principle of, of natural aristocracy, merit, meritocracy. So I think that next to our university, to continue to pursue new frontiers of knowledge, to continue to open the mind to what will occur tomorrow, and the only way we can walk freely into tomorrow is to know where we have been today and yesterday. A firm grasp of our history. I think I would like to be known as the author of our Declaration of American Independence. That not only speaks to us as Americans, it not only provides us within a good 20 minute read the founding principles of our nation, but it speaks to the family of man across this globe. And that will help to steer our rudder more directly as we move forward through generations yet unborn. And then finally, what could secure the liberty and freedom of the mind of man than a law that protects and defends one's opinion, particularly in matters of religion? Again, I cannot say it so often. Our creator has created our minds free and free. He desires it to remain incapable of any temporal restraints. And so therefore, I would like to be known as the author of the Statute of Virginia for religious freedom. That for religious freedom is so important to help us understand that everyone is entitled to hold their opinions upon religion as they choose and thereby protecting that liberty of the human mind. What could be more useful in support of our Declaration of American Independence and in support of a true university to cultivate, if you will, human knowledge and to help one realize that such cultivation and such pursuit of enlightenment is not free. It requires an eternal vigilance. By those three, as I've enumerated, I care most to be remembered as a testimonial that I have lived. Your next question. We have one final question for you. What are your hopes for the future of the University of Virginia? Well, I would hope that everything that I have already said provides further hope for what our University of Virginia can continue to be to everyone. And I mean not only to the white male freeholder, 21 years of age or older, who right now is the only, the only citizen of our nation who can vote. But I hope that our University of Virginia will follow the future to open up that franchise so that so many may have a voice 
and a vote in our government. After all, that would be the ultimate support of the first line in our constitution, is it not? We the people. I cannot see how the future would continue to say, well, we the people is only represented by the white male freeholder, 21 years of age or older. No, this is what a university allows in opening the mind further for further studies. And why is this so important? And why am I hopeful that this will continue now in Torah mobilis unto generations yet unborn? It is because that our government, any government, will only be so enlightened, will only be so moral, will only be so virtuous and knowledgeable as the people are themselves. And that history must always be our first and foremost read, reminding us where we've been so we have a better understanding of where we are and how we can continue to move forward, particularly pluribus unum, upon our founding principles. You know that... Uh, is near entirely the first paragraph in the bill I mentioned earlier for the general diffusion of knowledge, bill number 79, presented before the new Virginia House of Delegates in Williamsburg, Virginia, June of 1779. Perhaps I should simply finish by saying, rather than me to go any further, procure for yourself a copy of my bill for the general diffusion of knowledge. And in proper literary, proper collegiate, and universal fashion, simply read. Read that first paragraph. And there is your prescription for a happy future, a more free future on behalf of everyone. Well, citizens, my pleasure. I look forward to meeting with you again. I'm going to return here uh, to Mr. Barlow's, um, Mr. Barlow's hasty pudding. <laughs> what a real pleasure. I wonder whether Mr. Barlow would be interested to take up one of the chairs here at, uh, at our university. Um, he's been in France for some time, though, and maybe he would simply care to stay there. I would certainly understand it. I remain your humble and obedient servant, Thomas Jefferson. Godspeed.